Hey everybody, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. I know it's a little bit later than when I usually post. I think people are like in the middle of their day or at least um, at a place where they're starting their day by now. So I try to get on by 9.30. Hey Amaya, how are you? I know it's hot in Florida. Hey, Dwayne Hill. By the way, um, Brother Hill, I love your post. Um, the the quotes that you put up are so inspiring. I love the way that you do those. It's really awesome. Greetings and good morning, indeed. So um, I want to, this is a, a very um, serious and a very important topic that God has given me. Good morning, Sister Cherie. Good morning, Bishop Curtis. Um, very serious about your faith and about the um, the perspective that we either keep our godly perspective or that we lose or that rather than lose, I should say, that we exchange for our perspective. Um, and so the question that I'll lay before you um, as we get into it is um, who are you? Whose, whose faith or whose faith perspective are you following and who are you believing in? Because God has given you one um, system of order, which is um, according to our faith and, and the vision that he has for our life and the promised land is what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about our personal Canaan and our personal promised land and the promise that God has placed over our lives. And um, as we go forward, in our lives, as we continue to live our lives, I want to parallel it with um, Numbers chapter 13 and 14 and, and the children of Israel in the wilderness, just as they were being sent out, the, uh, the 12 were being sent out into the land of Canaan to go and investigate. Um, at this point, they've already left Egypt. They've been in the wilderness. Um, God has done many signs and miracles among them. He has shown them time and time and time again that he is God, that he is their deliverer, um, that he is a healer. He's shown them that, you know, that uh, he is a way maker, that they have nothing to fear um, with him. They've conquered at this point Jericho. They've conquered um, AI. They've conquered you know, they've, they've gone forward and, and, and I mean, literally God has laid before them all that they need to know, to believe, to take this last step, to go into the promised land and to possess the place that God has given them for their lives and not just for their lives, but also for the lives of their um, generations to come. Let me get to my notes because if I get to just talking y'all, I get I, I lose track and I end up being on way too long. So I'm going to, I try to manage myself with my notes. So let me do that. So the first thing I want to say is, is that, um, there is definitely, I talk about this all the time, that there is definitely a God destiny, um, for each one of our lives. God, when he breathed our, our existence into this world, he literally spoke, our, our existence into our mother's wombs. And when he spoke, what he spoke was our names, right? And so when he spoke your name into existence and you became um, um, a, a living being in your mother's womb, when you begin to form and to be shaped in your mother's womb, even before then, he had already destined uh, an assignment and a purpose for your life, Right. And you can go to Psalm 139. You can look at Jeremiah one. Uh, you can look at Jeremiah 29 and 11. You can look at Romans 8 and 30, 29, 31, somewhere in there. All of these places tell you that before the foundations of the earth, before uh, you ever entered your mother's womb, that he had a plan for you, that he's he's thinking of things that are good, good for you and not evil to bring you to an expected place. And so these promises of God are, are, are here for us. But then what happens? Pastor Hughley, how are you? Good morning. Good morning, Pedigay. Good morning, Minister Calvin, Carolina, uh, Brother Rick. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning, good morning. So what happens is, is that just like when the 12 went into uh, Canaan, 
there were 10 that saw with the natural eye. They saw the walls of the fortified cities. They saw the giants, right? And they came back with this negative report. And granted, I want you to think about your life. There are, there are so many people just in the last couple of weeks that I've had the pleasure and the opportunity to sit down with and to, to minister to as they're going through these trials and tribulations in their lives. And, and, and a lot of it is, is just simply what we are pressing up against. Um, you know, we think about what Paul says. He says, now forgetting those things that are behind, I press toward the mark, right? And so a lot of times what we're pressing up against is those things that, you know, things that have hindered us from the past. And so God is saying, I want you to keep moving forward. And, but something from the past makes you believe that there's an obstacle, that there's some kind of a trap or there's some kind of a, a negative uh, situation that's going to prohibit or keep you from moving forward. And so that was the case for, uh, those 10, of course, there was Joshua and there was um, Caleb that, that had a different report. And I'm going to talk about that. But the 10, they looked at the walls. They looked at the giants. They came back and they said, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's definitely flowing with milk and honey. Oh, yeah. That is the place that God described. I mean, you know, it's beautiful. It's lush. There are fig trees and, 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 and all kinds of, you know, um, resources there. But you know, the cities are fortified. And as a matter of fact, let me just give you an idea of what they were looking at. The walls that, that surrounded the cities that they were talking about were about 25 feet high and about 20 feet wide, right? So if you can imagine that, right, I'm five feet tall or five feet five tall. And, and if you stacked about four or five of me um, going in, in either direction, that's how thick and how tall these walls were. They had these walls that were um, surrounding the cities and then they were manned by captains. So imagine, put yourself in your life today, right? Put yourself in, in, in whatever situation it is that may be standing against you. If it's a sickness in your body, how thick is that wall? How tall is that fortified wall? The giants that they saw were anywhere between seven and nine feet tall. You see people walking around in this land that God has told you that you are to go in and possess, right? And you're looking at people who stand feet above you that have walls that are so thick that it would take men to lay uh, head to toe to even stretch the, the length and the width of that wall. And God is saying this to you and he's saying, I want you to go forward. I want you to move forward anyway. I want you to continue to trust that I am the God who will not forsake you. We know that Philippians 1 and 6 says that he who has begun a good thing will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And what that means is, is that when God starts to stir something up inside you and he begins to show you your destiny, it's going to be, you're going to go through a wilderness situation. And when you go through that wilderness situation in that wilderness time, before you get to the edge of the promised land, which is where they got, they got to the edge of the promised land and then failed in their faith. When the first time they failed in their faith, but it unfortunately for them was the last time because God sentenced them to death in the wilderness, everybody who was 20 years and above, but you get to that place. But before you get to that place, you're in this wilderness situation. And what does the wilderness look like? When you're in the wilderness, it's like, you know, you can't really see where the next resource is coming from. You don't know where the next paycheck is coming from. You don't know how the bill is going to get paid. You don't know how you're going to get past this sickness that you just was diagnosed with. You don't know how your loved one who just got a, a prison sentence for 15 or 20 years, you don't know how they're going to come out any sooner than what the man uh, or, the, or the judge who uh, sentenced them said that they would. Whatever the life circumstance is, right? You don't know. You can't really see when that's going to take place. Taking a note or a page from my own life, I've been waiting, right? I've been in this wilderness um, um, situation waiting for the deliverance of my husband. And I can equate that to being where, where he is. But what I have learned, and let me share this with you all. Please pay attention to these three things. Because when you see that there are mighty men and mighty women of God, 
And I asked God this and he gave me this answer. I said, God, I said, how is it that these mighty men and these mighty women of God that are called, I'm not talking about those that just come and do what they do to try to get money and to do whatever um, they think that, you know, they can get away with in the name of God. I'm talking about legitimate pastors and, and ministers and evangelists and people who are known around the world in particular, not just, but in particular, I want to point out those that have the, 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 the notoriety. How is it that they fall? How is it that they start off in such a situation where they are so on fire for God, but then you hear about all of this, this, this drama and all of this trauma and all of this, this stuff that goes on in their lives behind the scenes. Um, I'm trying to think of that pastor's name. He's gone now. Tim, he used to come on TV. And I remember watching him and I said, oh my God, he has such a, an on fire ministry. But with the eyes of the spirit, I could see that there was a lust demon attached to him. I didn't know that he had a drug situation going on too, but I could definitely see the lust demon that was attached to him. And I was like, God, how could he on one side have such a, a, a on fire ministry and such an on time word for you, but then have this thing like just, just hovering over his shoulder, like right in his back. I could see it y'all just that clearly. And here it is. Go back to the wilderness, go back to the children in the, in the wilderness as they were following God and God was so clear and so evident to them. No time prior to up to the point when Adam and Eve were in the garden, had any of the children that had followed God had ever had such a, um, relationship, you know, where God was so present, right up to that point. Um, you know, I mean, they, they were able to talk to God and hear for God, but God actually showed himself by way of being a pillar of fire by night and a, and a cloud by day. So they actually had the, uh, the opportunity to really be with God, to commune with God in that way. And so here they are in the wilderness. And here's the three things that they did. And I believe that these three things that they did are the same three things that, that trap the men and women of God today. They begin to complain in the wilderness. They begin to wonder, where's the delicious food? Where is the food? Why is the water bitter? How are we going to cross over this Red Sea? Here's my favorite one. Did God bring us, Moses, did you, did you bring us out here so that God could just bring us out into the wilderness and kill us? We were sitting and we were fine in Egypt eating by the flesh pots till we got full. But now we're out here and you mean we just going to die? They had, they had lost their faith in the promise that God had given them to take them to the promised land. They began to complain in the desert. The next thing was that they turned their faces from God. And then the next thing was that they, they touched the unclean thing. And so those are the tricks. Those are the things. If you, you can, I can, I, I really can't think of anything else. Maybe somebody else can. And, and if so, post it. But those are the three things that I find that God shared with me that takes people who are following God off the path. And this is where we have to be careful, y'all. We have to be careful because when we go off the path that God has placed for us, just like the children of Israel, they're in the wilderness because God sent them there right? He could have done this thing any way he wanted to do it. He could have taken them the more direct way and brought them right into the promised land. He could have killed all of the Amalekites and Hittites and, and, and all of the ites that were there. He could have taken care of them before they ever got there. He could have just, just left a death trail and let them just walk easily into the promised land. But there was work that they needed to do to exercise and to grow their faith. And so Whatever that gift is, whatever that promise is that God has placed before you, that your assignment is connected to, the thing that you have to do is to learn to develop your faith, even through the hard time, even when the, the wall is so high and so thick, you can't see over it because you're in the wilderness. You can't see where the next resource is coming from, but we know that God is God and he cannot lie right? He's not man. He's not going to lie. And if he said it, he will make it good. And we have to learn how to hold on to the promises of God. We've got to learn how to make sure that nothing comes and distracts us. So let's talk about the 10 that went into Canaan and brought back that negative report. We know that Joshua and Canaan said, we are well able. Yes, the report is true, but we are well able. So we can talk about that, but let's talk about the real deal. 
Because too often when we hear the negative report, we don't always rise up and, and we are we be the ones that initiate you know the negative report. More times than most, it's worse than that. And I say it's worse than that because you're waiting to hear what the popular consensus is. Just imagine if everybody had waited and, and, and wanted to see what the popular consensus was, including C Caleb and Joshua. Suppose Caleb and Joshua said, well, you know what? These 10, you know, they, they're going this way. So, you know, maybe we should just be quiet because, you know, it's going to be real hard for us to come up with a different report. We're telling them that the people there are seven feet and nine feet tall. We're telling them there that the walls are so fortified that you can't even, you know, see over them. And, and God knows how we're going to get through them. We're telling them all these things are true. And then they know that these people are fearsome warriors and they don't believe in God. They believe in idols. Joshua and Caleb said, but we are well able. Why? Not because I have such great faith and I'm such a great faith fountain, but, but because I have faith in the God who has brought us all the way through from Israel, drowned Egyptians in the Red Sea, brought us all the way to where we are now. That's why. And so God honored them because they kept their eye on the prize and they kept their eye where they needed to, um, to be where God was. Um, let me just look at my notes, make sure I'm not missing anything. Yep. So I just, I wrote here, a promise from God is a sure thing, no matter how unlikely it seems. God's word is not subject to the majority opinion. His truth is set apart from our feelings and situations. And so that's, that's another thing. If God tells you something, let me just share with you. God, um, and I've shared this with you all before, but God gave me this vision, right? Take this out. It's called Bethel, home of the Levites. And you might be able to see it. So this is a brochure for Lake Anna. And then this is the house plan for Bethel. Y'all, it's, to you know, I shared it with my husband. And one of the, none of the ways that I know that it's a confirmed uh, vision from God is because the moment that I shared it with my husband, my husband began to strategize over how we could plan it and how we could build it and, and what things needed to be done. And we are nowhere near in the natural in a place to build a multi-million dollar um, retreat center. Y'all know we do retreats. But God showed me. I was standing in um, Kings Mill, a beautiful four diamond resort in Williamsburg. I'm sitting in the conference room and I promise y'all God said to me just as clear as about three years ago. He said, this place is too small. I'm like, oh my God, what are you saying? You know, this place is too small. That's what the what, that's what God said. And I'm sure that that's how the children of Israel felt when they were told that they were going to be moving from, from Egypt into the promised land. Like, oh my God, how is this going to happen? But I'm believing God at his word. I don't have to worry about where the millions are going to come from. He will provide. I don't have to worry about how it's going to be built. He will provide. My only job is one thing. To rest in the promise. Rest. And so with that, I say the same thing to you. Whatever it is that God has given you to do, rest in the promise. Hear the instruction. Follow the instruction. God wants your complete and he wants your immediate obedience. And when you give him your complete and your immediate obedience, he's going to reward your faith with the vision and the promise that he's given you for your life. Be careful of voicing your negative opinion. We talked about complaining in the desert. I even named this thing. Emotional moments make you lose your godly perspective, right? So sometimes it will literally feel like your flesh is being torn away from your bones because anxiety is riding you so hard and depression comes in and you start to feel like, oh my God, how am I going to hold this thing together? And the, the, the natural thing is, is that when somebody comes and they say, hey, what's going on? How you doing? Or they come and they check on you. The natural thing that you want to do is to start to complain. You want to give them all of your complaints, right? And that's a trick of the enemy because God says, I am God. I'm God. So although you see 
although you see the valleys and although you see um, the, 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 short, the shortfalls or, or where things might not come together, don't believe with your natural eye. Believe with the spirit that God has given you, his Holy Spirit, that he will take you to the place that he promised that he would take you. All right, so God showed up among all the people. Let me get back to the story. I told y'all I have to stick to my notes. So anyway, so they have complained in the desert, right? They have, um, they have gone, they have seen what God has promised them. And then they come back, these 10, they come back and not only do they say, we're not able to do this and, and we're but grasshoppers in their sight, but they convince you know, that whole generation that they are right and God is wrong. Hear me when I say that. I'm, they, they literally convince everybody to side with them, with the 10 of them against God. God said one thing, they said another, and they convinced all these people to come to, to side with them. Right. And so what God then comes and he says, you know what? I'm just going to take everybody out. I'm going, I'm going to send a play because I'm done with them. And I'm going to tell you why they, why he was done with them. Because God said 10 times, 10 times you fail to trust me. And here they are. And the reason why I want to give you the 10 times is I want you to equate it to a situation in your life. It's not different, y'all. There's nothing new under the sun. The first time they failed to trust God, they lacked trust at the crossing of the Red Sea. When was the last time that you were facing something that seemed to be impossible and your back was against the wall? They failed to trust God at the Red Sea. The second time was that they complained about the bitter water at Mara. When was the last time that God gave you something, right? And it was it was um, bitter to the taste. It was it was a little difficult for you to deal with, but it was to sustain you. You had to you had to deal with the difficulty, but the difficulty was going to bring you to a place of sustaining. And you complain. When was the last time that took place? How about complaining in the wilderness, which is what I talked about? Them turning their back against. God, them complaining in the desert and saying, you know what? You brought us out here to kill us. We should have just stayed with the Egyptians. When was the last time that you got to, to a certain place in your life and you're following God and you're having faith in God, but now it's time for you to make that big step. You've been taking steps, but now it's time for you to make the big leap. And now you say, you know what? I should have just stayed in that apartment. Oh my God. I never should have taken this, this house note on. I didn't know that it was going to be like this complaining in the desert. How about collecting more of the daily quota of the manna than they were supposed to collect because they didn't trust God to, to provide for them every day? How many of us have been in situations, I'm raising my hand, because you, you, you look and you're like, okay, I got $45 to buy two weeks worth of groceries for me and my children. How am I supposed to make this last, right? And then I go to the, oh God, <laughs> I used to go to this, um, um, I can't think of the name of it. It was a um, Chinese food restaurant at Pittman Plaza underneath the dress shop. Those that are from Lynchburg know exactly what I'm talking about. But it used to be this Chinese food restaurant. And I would go there and take my girls there and take my sandwich bags there and put food in the sandwich bag, right? So that I could have extra food to try to take care of not trusting God. Stealing. The next one, collecting manna on the Sabbath. The, the Sabbath is holy. We're supposed to keep that holy. God said that he would give you enough. He would give them enough to cover the Sabbath. You didn't need to collect on the Sabbath because he didn't want you to work on that day. So going out and, and you know, the people who work seven days a week, right? And it's because you have the mindset that if I don't work seven days a week, I'm not going to make it. It's not by your strength or your might, but it's by God's spirit, says the Lord. God says that your wealth comes from him. He gives you the, the ability to get wealth. He says that he will give you riches and wealth that you won't have to labor or over. It is, it is his desire that you have prosperity, right? You don't have to do. So anyway, let me keep on complaining over the lack of water at Repidim, Com committing idolatry with the golden calf. How about when you do make it to a certain level and then you start to idolize the things that God have given you? In Romans, I think it's the first chapter and maybe the sixth, but it talks about worshiping the creation more than the creator, right? Um, complaining at Tabia, complaining over the lack of delicious food, uh, failing to trust God and enter the promised land, which was the ultimate one. And God says, okay, I'm done because 10 times I have showed y'all my mercy. I've shown you my grace. I've shown you everything that you need in order to know that I am God. And 10 times you have failed to trust in me. So you know what? I'm taking you out. And Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before the people. They were angry with them. 
Can you imagine leading people toward God? You have faith in God because you know what God can do. And they begin to complain and they do all of these things that I've here I've listed here. And and your mindset is, you know what God, I'm so done with them. And that's I mean, Moses and Aaron were angry. I'm so done with them. I mean, what else can I possibly do to show them, God, who you are? But they didn't take that route. But for the people, they laid on their faces, on their behalf. And they said, God, if you do this thing, it's going to, it's going to hurt your reputation. And not so much for the people, but because Moses and Aaron were interested in what unbelievers would think about God if he wiped them out in the desert, if he brought them out of bondage into the middle of the desert and then killed them all. So God said, okay, I'm going to be merciful. I've heard your prayer. I'm going to be merciful. And what I'm going to do is that all of these that are 20 and above will wander in this wilderness for 40 years. They will never see the promised land, my God. Hmm. Oh, I feel God right there. Whatever it is that God has given you to do, however it is that God is showing you your future and your vision, don't complain, don't draw back, press toward the mark because there is a day that will come and it will be too late. God is not mocked. What you reap, what you sow, you shall reap. And so what God said to them was that I won't kill you today. He was going to immediately take them out, but he calls for them to wander in the wilderness for 40 years until they died. Don't get in a place where you're wandering in this place, this wilderness place in your life until you die. <laughs> Jesus. There's a greater, there's a greater promise for your life. God didn't bring you here to leave you in the desert. He didn't bring you here for you to be in a place of lack all your life. His faith, his, his word says that he will give you peace. The other word for peace is shalom. Shalom means nothing broken, nothing missing, nothing lacking. He says, put your faith and your trust in me and follow me and I will take you there. But the moment that we start to listen to the 10, those naysayers, those that look at you and say, I don't even know how you even could imagine that you would do that. Don't you know who you are? Don't you know what you stand against? Don't you know who was in the office, the presidential office? Trump is in office. He's getting ready to make everybody so and so you fill in the blank. If you listen to those, because it wasn't just the 10, although he took the 10 out right away. He killed them by a plague. But the rest of them who listened to him stayed in the wilderness for 40 years until they died. You need to be careful who's in your ear. Oh God, <laughs> be careful who's in your ear. Who you're following will lead you either to your destiny or your death. Mm, Jesus. Golly. Mm. I got to slow my spirit down. Um, <laughs> God's truth, y'all. What he tells you, what he shows you is his truth. He has given you the spirit of truth. Those of us who have received Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we have opened our hearts so that God can dwell therein. And when we are born again, Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us. And the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. And he leads us and he guides us into all things that are true. And he tells us things that are to come. And watch this. God's truth is backed up by his character. <laughs> Golly. His truth is backed up by his character. So the very thing, Thing that God tells us who he is in the word of God, when he shows you something, he says, I'm going to take you here and you're going to have a five bedroom house with four beds, with four bathrooms. I, I don't mean to keep using materialistic things, right, God, because the, the promises of God are much greater than just materialistic stuff. But most of us could do so much more for God if the, if the burden of, of financial strain and stress was taken off of our shoulders. There are so many of y'all that want to go out here and on fire for God and you want to feed people and you want to pay somebody's mortgage and you want to take care of somebody's debt. You want to do what God has called all of us to do. 
but you can't do it because you have this burden that's on your neck. That thing that God has said that he's going to do for you in his, in your life, where he said he's going to take you, where he's, where he's showing you that you're going to go is backed up by his character. Find him in the word of God. I challenge you to go to the word of God and say, what does God's word say about my prosperity? What does God's word say about my peace? What does God's word say about my health? What does God's word say about my deliverance? And when you find it, stand on that word. Even if you just take one scripture, you stand on that word and you say, God, this is what you said about this situation for me. And I will not look to the left, nor will I look to the right. I'm going to keep my eyes on you. That you will make my way prosperous. You said, God, in Joshua 1, that if I study this word day and night, then you will make my way prosperous. Okay. Because the truth of the matter, as I get ready to close, is that not following the will of God for your life. You think you're facing problems now? You think you're in trouble now? You think that you've got mountains to climb and, and, and seven and nine feet tall giants in your way now? Stepping out of the path of the will that God has laid for you. Stepping out, sorry, out of the will of the path that God has laid for you will bring you into even more, even more problems, even more situations. And here's the difference. Because now that you have stepped off his path and you're out here uncovered, you don't have the, 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 the covering. You step, Psalm 91 says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of, his own, of the Almighty. When you step out from underneath the shadow of the Almighty, you expose yourself to the enemy who is seeking to and fro to see who he may devour, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. It may feel like that there's so much pressed up against you, but don't forget what Paul says. He says he presses toward the mark of the high call of God, which is in Christ Jesus. He used that word on purpose. There is a press toward the promised land. They didn't go into the promised land and not have to defeat the Amalekites and the Hittites and all of the other ites. There was a press. There is going to be a press to get you to where God has shown you you are to be. And he set that place on purpose. There is a, a in this world, in this life, there is the promises and the purposes of God. And then there is the reward of iniquity and of the enemy when you, when you don't follow God. And it's like, it, to me, it's as if, if you took the promises and the purposes of God and you flipped it upside down and said, you know what, I'm going to do it by my own strength. And here's the other thing. God laid that judgment down and he said, okay, for 40 years, y'all going to be in the desert. Don't you know that those hard-headed, stiff-necked people, hard-hearted people made up in their mind, well, we're going to go and we're going to go against them anyway. We're going to go into the, to the promised land anyway. And Moses told them, don't do this. Just like I'm saying to you now, when you come out from underneath the shadow of God, or from under the protection of God, he says, don't do this because God is not with you. And they went up. And they went against the, the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Am Am Amalekites and, and all of the kites, right? And they were destroyed. What God had given them, what rightfully belonged to them, they stepped off the path. They complained in the desert. They turned their faces from God. They touched the unclean thing and they rebelled against God. Let me get here. There's something that I want to share with you all. I pass my note. And I circled this because I wanted to. So listen, the path to open rebellion against God begins with dissatisfaction. Then it moves to grumbling about God and your present circumstances. Please be careful with that, y'all. Then it comes to bitterness and resentment. And finally, rebellion and open hostility, which causes separation from God. In other words, you take the side of, of man or the side of a circumstance that you're looking at against God. And so God wants you to enter into his rest. And in entering into his rest, if you go and you look at um, uh, Hebrews chapter 4, it talks to you about entering into God's rest. 
it tells you in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11. Um, hold on a second. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11. It gives you the instructions for entering into God's rest. But I'm just going to give you one, ver one verse of it. Um, it says, let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Let me back up. Number nine, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also have ceased, ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. How do we enter into God's rest? We believe that God has this relationship in mind for you. And this relationship involves, it entails, it, it, it brings together the whole mind of God. Jeremiah 29 and 11, for I know the thoughts that I have for you, thoughts of good and not of evil to bring you into an expected place. The promises of God, the, the assignment and the purpose that God has placed within you to help push you toward that promised place, that Canaan, that promised land that God has for you is wrapped up in the relationship that he desires to have with you. So believe that God has this relationship in mind for you. Cease from your own efforts. Stop trying to go out here like I was in the in the restaurant and stealing food and putting it in bags because, you know, God really don't have me in mind. He forgot about me today. He forgot that I need to feed my babies, right? Stop going out there. I used to go, <laughs> y'all used to do so much stuff. I had the water key. They turned my water off. I go out there and turn my own water back on, right? And and you know, sometimes I, you know, I mean, I know that we get to we. I, those are things that I did because I didn't have the the knowledge and the faith in God to believe that He would fix this thing for me. And and sometimes that's that bitter water. Remember when I talked about um, the ten things that they did, complaining about the bitter water at Mara. You know, sometimes that's that bit of water, you know, having to be in a situation where you're looking like, okay, my water is turned off. I didn't have enough money to pay my water bill, you know, but God will take you to a place where he will show you, show me, you know, maybe I didn't spend my money wisely. Maybe I wasn't really budgeting or maybe I didn't know how to budget my money. So the resources were there, but I used the resources in other ways, right? And so, um, that that took me and I you know what thank you brother um hill because you said real talk I'm going to share this testimony with you let me just share with you as I close well I'll give you these last two all right how to enter into God's rest believe that God has this relationship in mind for you cease from your own efforts to create it trust in Jesus to bring you into God's rest and determine to follow Jesus in obedience now I'll close with this testimony um when I met my husband right? Greg has an anointing for finance. Um, he has the kind of mind, he has a degree at Virginia Tech in, in accounting and finance. And, and he has a way of taking um, a little and just, and, and just making it, you know, a lot. He can take um, finances and cover everything that we need to have covered and still have money left over. You know, he, he just knows how to do that. I, I don't have that that anointing for that kind of finance. I'm, I, I know how to save and I know how to put it here. I can put it in this pot, you know, but pretty much what I put in that pot, you know, given any interest that it may accrue through whatever the bank system or whatever uh, product I'm using, um, that's about, you know, as far as I can go with it. I just, I don't think money like that, but he does. And so you can remember y'all probably about 20 years ago, uh, 15, 20 years ago. Remember before they got to EFT and you could write checks on Monday, but the check won't go clear to Friday or maybe Monday the next week. So you could float a check. Well, that was another one of my um, non-faith, unbelieving tactics that I used to do to try to take care of myself rather than trusting and believing that God already had me in mind and already knew that the days that I would go through where there would be, you know, struggle and lack as I'm going through the wilderness on my way to the promised land, he already knew those days were going to come and he had already provided for me. But I tried to take care of myself. So in comes Greg, we meet, right? And and I have this, this vision that God has given me to start um, a group home. Now, here's the other thing. When you, when God has given you something, when it's a vision, and, and this is going to be a part of the men's and women's retreat, I'm hoping that we'll get more men. We are actually sold out where the women are concerned, praise God. Um, but we do have more uh, slots open for men. But when, um, when God is showing you 
what your vision is or what your purpose is. You know, he's showing you your Canaan, in other words, your promised land. You will find that you already have been, been touching or doing some portion or part of that pretty much all your life. I can go back to when I was a young, young teenager, like 12, 13 years of age. I was taking care of my little cousins and, and whatnot then. You know, and so, you know, taking care of babies and taking care of kids was always a part of my destiny. Today, I've been a social worker for 25 years. I've been running independent living and group homes for the last 16. That was a destiny of mine. It was it was what God gave me to deliver me out of my Egypt, to deliver me from having to use the water key to turn my water back on when the man would come and shut my stuff off. It delivered me from my children to this day, and they know better now, but, you know, to this day, they used to think that we would just have these fun camp out nights. I would tell them we were camping inside the apartment, but the electricity was off y'all. So I lit candles, you know, and, and we had food that, you know, that, that I could get out of the refrigerator that didn't have to be cooked. And we had, and I'd lay a blanket on the floor and set candles. And I'd say, you know, we're camping out tonight. And, and that was what I told them so that we could get through what we were going through. But the whole time, when even when that was going on, I had, you know, at one point a girlfriend who said, I'm moving. I don't have a place to go between this time and this time. I need about three weeks for somewhere for my girls to go. We moved her girls in and I took care of them. There were other kids and other grownups. I'm telling you, if you would if talk to my children, they would tell you their whole life as we were growing up, as they were growing up, there was never really a time of, of much distance where there wasn't somebody, some children or even adults that were living in our house. Because that was the destiny that God gave me. Now watch this. When the destiny came to pass and I met Greg and, and we began to build this business, I still had the mindset of poverty. I still had the mindset of Egypt, right? So I'm still floating checks trying to, to show Greg that I'm on the level, you know, of being able to, to financially hang with him to get this done. But that wasn't the reason that God brought us together. God brought us together because he did have the financial wherewithal to bring the vision to pass. And I had the vision. Operationally, I could get it done. Fiscally, he could get it done. And so I had to, I had to learn this the hard way. So here's what happened. So one time he comes down and we needed to get something taken care of. And I had to admit to him that my bank account was $500 overdraft. So he looks at me. He says, okay, he pulls out his checkbook. He writes me a check for $500 and he covers the debt. A few weeks later, maybe a month or so later, the same thing happens, right? Because I am not even living at this point paycheck to paycheck. And don't look, I'm, I'm in the wilderness because at this time, this same very time where I'm trying to establish a group home, a home for other people who are homeless, I'm about to lose my own house. My house is in foreclosure at this point as I am trying to establish a house for other people, right? And that wasn't that. Yeah. Now, the one thing that I did do, let me make this clear. The one thing I did do on time, all the time, every time was I paid my rent. You know, that was the one thing that was a system of structure that I learned. No matter what you pay, you make sure you pay your rent, keep a roof over your head. But this was during the time of subprime lending. And I ended up with household beneficial. And that's another whole long story. But they were trying to take my house, y'all. And I'm trying to establish a house for people who have nowhere to go. So Greg comes back in and, and I'm trying to take care of this, this, this situation that's on my neck and my shoulders. And I'm still trying to show him because I'm so, watch this, fearful that he, what God, the resource God sent me is going to leave me. And, and if I don't prove myself, if I don't put this in my hands and do something to prove myself that he's not going to, he's not going to want to go into business with me. So when he's away in Richmond, I'm still writing checks and trying to trying to, to, to put up the front like I'm taking care of stuff. Meanwhile, I'm digging a hole deeper and deeper and deeper for myself. Why? Because I'm acting out of my own strength and not relying on God to be my provider and not being a, a vessel of honor, which would be truthful to call Greg and say, I can't afford that right now. I just had to pay my rent or just had to pay my mortgage and I had to put food in the house. I have no more money. And so when we do things in our own strength and we step out of the will of God, Satan is too uh, eager to come in and to bring us to a place of shame. So then Greg comes down a few weeks later, about a month or so later, and it may have been a little longer than that, but I was in debt again, bank account overdraft again, because I'm writing checks. And this time something different happened. I said to him that he just wrote a check for $500. I said to him, my account is overdrawn again. He says, how much? I said, it's, you know, might have been another four or five hundred dollars. This time he pulls the checkbook out. He writes the check. 
He hands me the check. He never says another word. He turns around and goes back out. This I mean, he hadn't been, he had just gotten to Richmond. He hadn't been in town 10 minutes, long enough to write a check, turn around, went back out the door, got in the car and went back to Richmond. And then <laughs> I got the revelation. I said, either you're going to stay in this place where you are, or you're going to dry this mess up that you've been doing all your life long, trying to, to, to do stuff, you know, uh, robbing Peter to pay Paul and all that kind of craziness. You're going to get it together. So later, when I, I felt like I, you know, I had to get my emotions and get myself together because, of course, I was humiliated. And, because I, and, and of course, I was embarrassed by, you know, having to show him how unready I really was. Um, when I got myself together, I called him and I said, I don't know where my money is going. I, I really don't. I, I'm trying to pay everything that I'm supposed to pay. And I'm trying to um, take care of the stuff that we need to get taken care of. And I just didn't want you to feel like you were in this by yourself. And we had a long discussion. And that weekend he came back and he pulled all my bills. And he sat down with me and he showed me how to pay stuff. And we got stuff paid off. And today, as a result of that, and that wasn't like a two-month training, y'all. That was years in the making. It took him years to get me to a place to understand finances in a way that now my credit score is about 780. I never would have imagined. That's a Canaan in and of itself. I never would have imagined. I remember going into Shules when I was younger. My first marriage, we went in and we wanted to buy furniture. The lady laughed at us. She pulled up my credit. She laughed at us. And we walked out of the store. My credit was not even, you couldn't even call it credit. But this is, you can look at this as a Canaan for me. Because now I can go anywhere I want to go and I can purchase anything I want to purchase. But here's the thing, the mindset renewal. I'm not using credit cards and, and, and blowing my credit up like this because God is my provision. And so I'm moving myself now to the next level, which is cash system only, debt free. I'm not looking to go buy something and then have 24 months of paying it off behind me. I don't want nothing behind me. I want to pick it up and go. So that's all I got, y'all, because I could that could be a whole nother teaching. Um, love y'all. Thank y'all for for um, for joining me. And um, bless y'all. Bless you, Sis Eleanor. Hey, um, Sis Eleanor, my Aunt Dot gave me a wonderful testimony about you just yesterday, day before yesterday. Mighty woman of God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for who you've always been. I see my sister. I love you. Brother Keith Kendrick. Um, oh, man. Dada, Grace Karanja. Uh, Dada is sister in Swahili, y'all. All the way from Africa, from Nairobi. Bless y'all. And I will talk to you soon.